from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous vile and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on John Straffen. John Straffen was born on February 27, 1930 in Borden Camp, Hampshire, England. So let's get into some history for that time. In 1930, the United States was experiencing its very first year of the Great Depression, which began with the stock market crash of 1929, and it was made exponentially worse by the 1930s as well as the Dust Bowl. In India, the 200-mile march began with Mahatma Gandhi as they walked to the salt beds of Jalalpur. This was a nonviolent protest and the first of his acts of civil disobedience against the British rule of India. Uruguay won the very first FIFA World Cup, defeating Argentina, but news from Argentina was the government was overthrown by a coup in September. The president was forced out of power and the opposition was met with very little resistance. A deadly hurricane hit the Dominican Republic with 200 mile per hour winds and killed more than 8,000 people. Also in 1930, the city of Constantinople in Turkey changed its name to Istanbul. Also this year, the first woman to fly solo from England to Darwin, Australia was Amy Johnson. And for the first time ever, a television drama was broadcasted. It was the production of Luigi Perandello's The Man with the Flower in His Mouth, and it was broadcasted by the BBC out of London. And then I love it when this news comes around because the ninth planet in our solar system, though it was unfortunately later demoted, Pluto was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh. Some notable people born in 1930 include Ray Charles, Clint Eastwood, Jean Hackman, Princess Margaret, who was the sister of the current Queen of England, Steve McQueen, and Sean Connery. So this was the atmosphere that John was born into. His father was John Straffen Sr., who was a soldier in the British Army, and the base he was stationed at is where John was born. I couldn't find any information about John's mother, not even her name, but we do know that she was a homemaker. John was the third child born in the family. He had an older brother and an older sister who was labeled a, quote, high-grade mental defective unquote. She later died when John was 22 years old, but John would later go on to be diagnosed as feeble-minded and had learning disabilities. When John was two years old, his father was stationed in India, so the whole family packed up and moved there for six years. There is very little information at all about his years in India, really none, but there was a reference to a serious illness while he was there. So John had indeed suffered an attack of encephalitis that a later electroencephalograph would show. In 
So what is that? Well, encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain and it is most often caused by a virus. According to the Mayo Clinic, encephalitis causes flu-like symptoms like fever and headache or sometimes no symptoms at all. It can also cause confused thinking, seizures, or problems with senses or movement. It can also cause agitation and hallucinations. The long-term damage to the brain can cause memory problems, personality and behavioral changes, intellectual disability, speech and language problems, and emotional and psychological problems. So when John was eight years old, his family moved from India back to England and they settled in Bath, Somerset. His father had taken a discharge from military life. Now, no sources really explain in any detail. It is said that John's mother had to, quote, overcome very difficult circumstances and make the best of her situation. Now, guys, we can read a lot into that, obviously. I mean, was John's father abusive? Possibly. We do know that they were quite poor once they got back to England. They lived in a tiny house or apartment, and life was cramped and hectic. It didn't take long after their return to England that John began to get into some trouble. He was described as sullen, withdrawn, solitary and was extremely paranoid about the police. It was also mentioned in a few sources that he had suffered a head injury, but from what and where the injury occurred is a mystery. So again, after getting back from India, eight-year-old John began stealing and skipping school. He was in constant trouble and was eventually caught and referred to a, quote, child guidance clinic, unquote. The next year, he was in juvenile court due to stealing a woman's purse and was sentenced to two years of probation. Due to John's mental situation, not to mention no one at home seemed to be able to work with him, His own probation officer could see quite clearly that he didn't understand what being on probation even meant, or really the difference between right and wrong. He lacked a certain emotional maturity, even for his young age. So the probation officer took the now nine-year-old John to a psychiatrist, and that psychiatrist certified him as a, quote, mental defective under the Mental Deficiency Act of 1927. A report was then put together about him where it was stated that his IQ was just 58, which would be thought of as having a significant disability. For a now 10-year-old boy, the experts stated he was mentally about a six-year-old. John was sent to a residential school called St. Joseph's School for Mentally Defective Children. Their words, not mine. In 1942, the now 12-year-old John was moved to Besford Court, which is a second level or senior school. In their reports, they stated that he was moody, solitary, he did not take behavior correction very well at all. Four years later, the school again reevaluated his mental maturity and IQ, which was determined to be about nine and a half years old, his IQ being now 64, and for whatever reason, they recommended he be discharged. In 1946, he was sent back home to Bath, but was still required to visit the medical center. That officer examined him and determined that John still fit the guidelines under the Mental Deficiency Act. John was cleared to go get a job and he did find several short-term jobs, but he did finally settle into a job as a machinist at a clothing factory. The next year, 17-year-old John began entering random homes where the owners were not there and he was stealing small items, 
But he didn't take the items home, rather he hid them, thus beginning his time of stealing regularly. But in July of 1947, John grabbed a 13-year-old girl. He covered her mouth and sang into her ear, quote, What would you do if I killed you? I have done it before, unquote. We must assume that the girl either didn't report it or didn't see his face because John wasn't connected to this incident until six weeks later. John had gone back to the girls' property. He grabbed and killed five of her family's chickens. They knew it was John this time and he was arrested where he chuckled during the full confession that he gave. He found it humorous. He even confessed to crimes that they had not even known about yet. John was, yet again, examined by his medical officer while he was in jail, determined him mentally compromised, and he was then committed to Hortham Colony in Bristol under the Mental Deficiency Act yet again. So that was John's childhood. Now John's father was a military man, but we have no reports that his father was cruel to him. I'm sure his father, being conditioned by military life, liked things around him to be handled a certain way. But again, none of the articles I read ever even hinted that John was abused in any way. We know John had a sister who was mentally handicapped as well. Could she have contracted the same virus in India that John had? I mean, could she too have had encephalitis? That condition could explain some of his later behaviors as the inflammation could have damaged parts of his brain. But perhaps his mother might have been, I don't know, I'm not very good with the politically correct terms for these issues. His mother might have been slow, diminished on some level. We know she was not capable of taking care of him once they moved back to England from India. She appeared to be too overwhelmed to help him. So after he got into trouble, it took his own probation officer to pay enough attention to try to get him some help. And bless that man, by the way. John's mental age was much younger than his chronological one and his favorite hobby seemed to be stealing. He knew enough as he got older to hide the things he stole so that his family or really anyone else would not stumble upon his trophies. This shows that, while mentally disabled, he still knew that what he was doing was wrong. But the telling part is the killing of the chickens, for me anyway. Now, chickens are used as a food source, of course, but after he physically grabbed the girl, asking her what she would do if he killed her, and that he had done it before he left, he came back to her residence and killed five chickens by wringing their necks for no reason. We know that the torture or abuse of animals is one of the signs of some serious trouble. So John was placed in schools that were better equipped to handle him, but he seemed, you know, reluctant to participate and that was noted as well. Out of all of that, I find it fascinating that he found it humorous and laughed while he was confessing his crimes. He didn't hold back, and in fact, he confessed to many more crimes that the authorities either hadn't known about or didn't suspect him of at all. So Hortham Colony was the first institution of its kind to be functionally designed and built as a complete colony designed to be able to house and care for around 600 patients at capacity. Under the Mental Health Act of 1913, Bristol City Council decided to buy up some land and build the institution to care for the mentally handicapped and was later called, quote, the Hortham Idiot Colony, unquote. It was 126 acres and the intent of the lower security or quote open colony was to teach things like agriculture and so on. 
to help the patients be able to assimilate in regular society again and maybe be able to you know work for themselves and take care of themselves john's records indicated he was not violent he was not dangerous he didn't show any super negative propensities and actually he was rather well behaved so he was kept from the more dangerous inmates in 1949 they transferred him to an even lower security facility that specialized in agriculture in winchester and again he acclimated and behaved rather well but it didn't take too long and he began to slip back he was caught stealing a bag of walnuts and was sent right back to Hortham a year later. Then while back there, he got into some kind of trouble and he was sent back home to his family because, you know, he was an adult now. So in 1951, the now 21-year-old John was examined at a Bristol hospital where they did an electroencephalograph. The results showed that he had, quote, wide and severe damage to the cerebral cortex, unquote. So what would that look like? The cerebral cortex is the outermost layer of the brain and it is made up of tightly packed neurons. It's the wrinkly outside part that we all know. It's responsible for higher thought processes, including speech and decision-making, how we think and process the information we receive from our senses. It's divided into four lobes, the frontal, which we talk about quite a bit with head injuries and serial killers, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital lobes, and each of the four are responsible for processing different types of sensory information. Side note, as we accumulate knowledge throughout our lives, the more kind of wrinkly the cerebral cortex gets. Fun facts. While the authorities and the medical officer kept an eye on what he was doing, he was allowed to get a job at a market garden and he was permitted to go back and live with his mother because sources say she was better equipped to care for him, though I don't know why or how. But he was then sent back to Hortham to be reassessed and they stated he still needed supervision for a further five years. He and his family submitted an appeal disputing this decision, like all of a sudden they care. So he was evaluated again and they determined his mental age to be about 10 years old. So they reduced the supervision down from five years to only six months. Now keep in mind, he's 21 to 22 years old at this point with the mental age of a 10 year old. So, during all of this, John had a, quote, smoldering hatred and intense resentment for the police, unquote, and placed all of his life troubles on them. He was due for yet another assessment, and on the morning of that assessment, though there isn't enough proof to say it was John, a young girl named Christina Butcher was murdered. There was plenty of news coverage about it, and it is speculated that if John was the one that did it, he saw not only the fame in the murderous act, but that it created a lot of work and tension within the police, whom he hated, as we all know. In July 1951, John decided to go to a movie theater to see a movie all by himself. On his way there, he saw five-year-old Brenda Goddard outside in her yard picking flowers innocently. He approached that little girl and he told her he knew of, you know, a better place to pick flowers. So she walked over to him and he lifted her over a small fence and then he just casually began to strangle her. When she didn't scream, he hit her head against a rock over and over until she was dead. He then left the body right where it laid and went to see the movie, which by the way was shockproof in case you were wondering. 
The movie is about a male parole officer who falls in love with his wayward female client and decides he's going to change her. So, fun fact. A couple of weeks later, he was questioned by the police as a suspect in that murder. They had also visited his employer, and that questioning led to John being fired. And again, because of the police being, you know, all up in his business, his hatred of them grew, and he felt like they were following him everywhere. A week later, John went to the movies again, and this time he met nine-year-old Cicely Batstone. She had been at the theater as well, and he befriended her and talked her into going to see another movie. When that movie was over, he took the girl on a bus. He got off at a meadow kind of on the edge of town, then strangled her to death. Now, this of course meant, being broad daylight and all, that there were witnesses. The bus driver recognized John. There was a couple also in that meadow that saw John with the young girl, and even a policeman's wife had seen John with that girl. When the woman told her policeman husband, he thought not too much about it, but when it was, oh, okay, that way. The policeman's wife told her husband, and then it was announced that the girl was missing, so the wife was able to lead officers right to where she had seen John and the girl, and there they found that little girl's body. So the police went to John's house and arrested him for the murder. He confessed to both murders willingly. He was then charged with murder and was in jail awaiting trial. In October 1951, John's trial began and the only witness heard was Dr. Parks, who was the medical officer at the Horfield prison. And he testified to John's medical history and stated he was quote, unfit to plead, unquote. The doctor went on to say, quote, in this country, we do not try people who are insane. You might as well try a baby in arms. If a man cannot understand what is going on, he cannot be tried, unquote. And thus the jury agreed, and he was sent to Broadmoor Institution, which is a, a whole nother podcast in and of itself, if you've never heard of it. Broadmoor was originally called a criminal lunatic asylum, but was later, after the Ministry of Health took over, the people committed there were then called patients. And while there, John worked as sort of a janitor. Six months into his stay, John went with some other patients and an attendant to clean some outbuildings on the grounds. John got around a corner by himself. He climbed the side of a building onto the roof and jumped over the wall. Not even 20 minutes later, guys, he walked up to the driveway of Doris Spencer, who was in her yard gardening. He asked her for a drink of water and she obliged. They then discussed how close she lived to Broadmoor and how easy it might be for one of them to escape. And then he left. An hour and a half later, he walked up to five-year-old Linda Boyer, who was innocently riding her bike around her neighborhood. It is thought that he grabbed her, strangled her, and killed her, or at least that was the story. There are some that say that they heard the girl screaming at like seven o'clock that night, which was after John had been recaptured. But most likely he is the one that killed her and her body was found the next morning. John was free for a total of four hours before he was recaptured roughly seven miles away from Broadmoor and he was able to murder that little girl that quickly if he was the murderer. During the trial for this murder the judge found him mentally fit to stand trial. He was hearing none other and was ultimately sentenced to be hanged later that year. But not long after his sentencing, the Home Secretary revoked his death sentence by reason of insanity. 
After that, he was moved from prison to prison pretty often. And in May of 1968, he was moved to Durham prison in the top security wing. Guess who was there with him at the same time? That's right, child killer Ian Brady. Guards commented that John never spoke unless he was forced to, and he spent a lot of his outdoor time sort of walking in circles and banging his head or fists on the fence every few minutes. John died at Franklin Prison in November 2007 at 77 years old. He had been in prison for 55 years, which broke the British record at that time. After that, Ian Brady broke the record with his own death 10 years later. So, I wish I had more information about John's family background. Truly, I do. Not just anyone is allowed to join the military. We all know that. So, one would have to believe that John's father was at least of average intelligence and was at least a somewhat successful soldier. We know virtually nothing about John's mother other than she made the best of her situation and was a housewife. That's pretty generic. There were three children and two of them had been diagnosed with mental deficiencies. I just don't know how disabled John's sister was, but John was pretty severely so. That makes me think that it had to have been more than encephalitis that John suffered while in India since his sister was mentally disabled as well unless she suffered the exact same thing, and that's not entirely out of the question. But there is no mention of the older brother, so we have to assume he turned out at least decently okay. So it would be hard to point any fingers in any particular direction with this case. The authorities, the doctors, the facilities, they all did their best to help him in his youth, and the law only allows them to hold people for so long based on the severity of their offenses. We know this. They didn't think, at least when he was quite young, that he was any danger to society. It's too bad it took at least two murders and most likely a third for them to see that he was in fact dangerous. But what do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing or YouTube under the same name of this podcast. You can visit my website at serialkilling.squarespace.com and also consider sponsoring the podcast. I have a Patreon. It takes a lot of time to put these together, but I love it. And thank you so much for listening. I appreciate every single one of you because I know that you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. Thank you and have a great day.